And these are the main pillars. There are three components in the Horizon 2020 material that the names for these themes. So number one is excellent science that includes, for example, the uh, European Research Council. So projects that will be uh, funded and uh, selected by a scientific excellence pure. Uh, number two is industrial leadership that uh, contains some emerging technologies that would be useful for the industry in the future. And third is the societal challenges. That's actually the largest of those themes. And that's about, you could call them, I guess, grand challenges to be addressed by science. So, so there are challenges raised by mitigating climate change, tackling the energy issue, and uh, the work problem shouldn't actually say what kind of technology or approach you should be used to tackle these problems, but, but they, they can be proposed. So this is kind of bottom-up bottom -up approach to societal challenges. And I will up some figures. The societal challenges part is by a greater largest. It's about 30 billion euro. Uh, the Exxon Science is 23. That's the, the balance that, that was chosen for these different areas. Now we're com coming to a different initiative which will be funded under the Horizon 2020, the, the industrial, no, the societal challenges part. So this is basically a public private partnership, but the innovation hub described by the previous speaker. This is focused on the, on the bioeconomics or how to smart to use biomass and kind of products you can get out of there. And this is special in the sense that uh, the industry is very strongly committed. They have committed 2.8 billion euros for this uh, program and the commission is investing uh, additionally 1 billion there. So the majority of the funds uh, come from private sources. This is supposed to operate for seven years, from 2014 to 2020. So it's quite substantial. And uh, this focuses on competitiveness uh, through reindustrialization of Europe, and also it plays in the form of rural development. So that it's a local, local aspect for creating jobs. So these are the goals that uh, are set for this uh, GDP policy. So basically, it will uh, create new cooperation between uh, the academia and the different industries participating, create new value chains for the bio-based products, and uh, specifically chemicals and materials. And this also has a heavy emphasis on demonstrating things. So we are expecting five uh, so-called flagship projects that will be big pilots or, or even uh, demonstration plans at commercial level. And uh, we, of course, hope one of these flagships would be in Finland in the future. These are companies are pretty active. So um, today there are 48 companies participating. The associate members are research organizations in the universities, there are 49 of them. And then there are a European technology platform and different kind of associations also affiliated with this. And to, to sort of bring this down to practices is the call procedure that I took to be in my set of slides. So so they will be forming in the top left for the Bio-Based Industries Consultation, which is the industry part of this. They will be forming task forces to develop the work program. And they will uh, take also representatives from the European technology platforms, and, uh, which covers the stakeholders, also industry, research and technology organizations, as well as NGOs. Also in the 
you have to lock the components. And uh, then there's writing, writing the annual work plans and the call test. And uh, at, at point four and five, you see that this will be totally open calls, so you don't have to be a member to uh, submit a proposal. You can get a grant even if you're not affiliated with the BDI before. And the evaluation will be carried out by individual experts in the peer review. And I think that's what I wanted to say about this one. Uh, I should say about the governance part that, that there are, there's a separate office that will be created to run, run, run this public private partnership, so separate from the Commission. And they will take care of distributing almost 4 billion euros and it will be governed by the governing board that where five seats are for the industry and five seats for the commission so it's pretty pretty power there. Okay then there's a different concept there's the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. This was modeled after the MIT or the success of the MIT in commercializing commercialized the results, but the outcome looks, looks a bit different, and I'll come to that. The basic idea is to bring the higher education, the research, and, and as a third part, the industry and the small and medium-sized companies together to create innovation in, in an entrepreneurial driven manner. And the EIT wants to become a catalyst and create a step change in, in the innovation capacity of the European Union. And this is kind of a pioneer uh, initiative in, in this term. And it operates through the KICS, you know, the Knowledge and Innovation Communities. And the EIT announced its first, first call for KICS in uh, 2010, it will come up here. And there are three peaks operating right now. So these are selected based on an open call. The of them are now selected. It's a duration of seven years at the minimum. And then they have to become self-sustainable in order to be uh, continued. So they have seven years. Once or money from the EIT, and, and in that time they have to create a sustainable funding basis. And the companies, the industries are heavily involved in drafting the, the plans for the PICS itself. When the Commission was evaluating those, those plans, they were committed for the involvement of the small companies and, and the existing industries as well. And these were formed as, as a separate legal bodies, independent legal bodies, and they have a great degree of autonomy to operate. And also the explanation is that the EIT funding covers only about 25% of, of the total budget of our team. And they have to get 75% of the money from other sources. It could be framework program money, it could be national Money, but they need to have also industrial uh, co-funding or, or industrial participation. So um, also in kind is accepted from the industry, so the industry could actually work on se several key projects and count their own work as part of funding for, for this key. And what key consists of so-called co-location centers practice on university campuses located in, in various places in Europe and you would have five or six of these kicks in uh, sorry co-location co centers in this kick. And the first ones selected are on climate kick. It's been running since 2010. I think they were chosen there's one for the ICT, so information and communication technologies, and that's the only one that Finland is participating at the moment. And there's a 
also to separate from the you know, energy or the energy technologies field. And here I'm not showing how those different co location centers are scattered all over Europe and how you think we have a kind of a good, good spread. Many countries are participating in this in one key. There are new calls coming up by the EIC and uh, 2014 teams are over there as well as uh, the next call planned for 2018. I think the next ones uh, in 2014 they are quite fixed, they've been the same for I think one, one year, one year and a half now. 2018 is more far out so there could be some changes there. And the EIC is going to spend a little over billion for the duration of the horizon 2020 in, in the peaks. Okay, now we're coming to the Finland part then, and uh, I have just some basic facts about Finland. So we're located in the northeastern corner of the EU, with a small nation, 5.4 million in population, only uh, quite large in land area, particularly sixth largest in the European Union, and uh, we are part of the Euro Dollars as well, and we've been members of the EU since 1995. And I thought I'd collect some famous things there. There's the Penguin Guy, some of you know, she's the guy that created Linux with a Openness, open innovation approach, and this Linux tool office. And uh, some of the hockey fans might know Yari Puri, a famous NHL player, Ben Jelanek, a bit later, and Sam Koivu. So we have some famous hockey players in the NHL, as well as the former president of Finland, Matti Ahtisari, who just recently won, was awarded the uh, Nobel Peace Prize efforts and negotiation of peace in, in various parts of the world as well. So why look at Finland? Well, there has been a consistent success for Finland in different kinds of international rankings. And this is the, the competitiveness ranking by the World Economic Forum. So we are competitive environment for the companies to operate in. And we ended up in third after Singapore and uh, Switzerland. And the EU uh, comes also the EU Innovation Scoreboard. So this is the innovation community and there we ended up in fourth after Sweden, Germany and, and Denmark. So um, we must have been doing something like right now, I think I have some of the examples. Yes. Uh, this Finnish is the Finnish Bio Economic Cluster. It's a, it's a public private partnership as, as BDI in the EU circuit as well. And uh, I'll tell you the concept. Uh, the short abbreviation comes from the Finnish words, but, but the English names are Strategic Centers for Science, Technology, and Innovation. There are six of them operating in Finland right now in the sectors that were deemed to be economically important for, for Finland. And uh, this civic used to be the forest cluster LTD, so its roots are in the forest industry and it has gone through the transformation to, to the bioeconomic field. So it's uh, broadened with focus and it's looking for new members from the chemical industry. By the, time. the other ones are operating in, in uh, metals and mechanical engineering, energy and environment, the three is there. Then there's one for the built environment, one for health and well-being, and uh, the sixth one is for, uh, it used to be for uh, information and communications technologies, but it has transformed itself now also partly 
going to the, to the uh, changes that we've gone going through in the sector, in Finland, but, but it's now for digital services more than developing the, the hardware and software technologies. So the, these shocks were established in, in uh, areas of economic importance for Finland, and this building has been in operation for six years now. It's a public-private partnership, so it has company shareholders actually. Companies are very central and they are the drivers in developing a strategic research agenda for 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 these shops and as well as the living the one shops. And then uh, they initiate research programs based on these agendas and uh, the bold part is somewhere between I would say uh, 14, 50 million euros annually run by by one, one uh, of these centers. So that's the annual turnover or, or the volume of the program portfolio. And this is one of the means to bring the industry and, and the academia together because one, once the research agenda was set, then they started to collect actually our brightest researchers and best research institutes and research groups together in order to actually solve the challenges that uh, were listed and, and also to seize the opportunities that have been identified before. And this is the program portfolio they are running, but I'm not going to go any deeper into that. Uh, this is another example and this the fact that, that uh, state-of-the-art knowledge is also needed for doing these things, carrying out these things that, that end up hitting the mar market somewhere down the way. Uh, there's this field pro program, I was in the launching stages, the program manager at DEPES and later the program director. So the basic idea in this Finland is this professional program is to offer the possibility for foreign professors to come to Finland to work with our best researchers and best research groups. And uh, there are actually two levels of, of grantees. There, there are the distinguished professionals that are uh, well, well on their way on their career and there are also the physical fellows, the, the, the future stars people that have done successfully their postdocs and are looking for actually a new institution to go to. And this was a need that came up pretty soon when we opened the program. So we uh, came up with a fellow instrument about one or two years after. So the program
So I'm going to stop here and take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be around, so I'll just come talk to me. Thank you. Thank you. I invite our panels for our next session, um, the Roundtable Discussion on Innovation Ecosystems. Come up here. Uh, I'll introduce the moderator, and uh, she can introduce the panels. So our moderator today is Amy Francis. From, she's the CEO and a co-founder of the Clean Energy Trust in Chicago. Um, she has over 18 years of operational and executive management experience in the high technology sector with specialties in clean tech and information technology. Uh, prior to Clean Energy Trust, she worked as an investment professional at NBC Capital, and before that, um, was an entrepreneur in residence with the Stanford Research Institute in California. Welcome. Amy. So much to Cyril for having us here today and to Argon for hosting this discussion. Um, we're very excited to be here and to talk to you a little bit about some of what's happening in the Midwest um, in energy innovation. And we are charged with talking about the ecosystem. And so we're very fortunate that we have three really unique perspectives on that here. Um, and I, what I'm going to do in, in five minutes, I'll allow them to introduce themselves and then talk about what each of their organizations is doing because it's pretty diverse and I think you'll enjoy hearing um, some of their personal stories. Uh, but first I just wanted to mention a few things about Clean Energy Trust. I run the organization. We've been around for three and a half years. We're partners with uh, Argon on the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. One of the unique things that we're doing on that project is engaging the venture community to help identify some of the most promising research for commercialization and for um, turning into startup companies. So that's one of the specialties of Clean Energy Trust is that really early stage science to company commercialization um, path. And we do three things. We provide mentorship for free to the scientists and the startup companies, the entrepreneurs. We work only in the Midwest, uh, so we work across nine states in the Midwest. We provide funding. We're often the first money in to a lot of these companies, and we do that through our Clean Energy Challenge, um, which is our annual business contest. And the next one is April 3rd here in Chicago. This will be our fourth year doing it. To date, we've uh, provided $740,000 in funding in three years, and those companies that we've um, taken through our event, either companies that have gotten funding from us or ones that were finalists, have gone to raise over $40 million in additional public and private funding. So we're very, very pleased to see that these companies are surviving and getting to the next stage and uh, convincing angel investors uh, to fund them to the next stage of investment, as well as convincing the federal government. They're winning ARPA E grants and SBIR grants. So it's working really well, and we're very pleased to be part of this really thriving research community in the Midwest. And then the last thing we do is advocacy. So we do um, advocate on behalf of policies that help grow the market, for especially for these young companies. And right now we're working on the, um, the Illinois Renewable Portfolio Standard Fix. Uh, we're getting very engaged with Shaheen Portman at the federal level. We'll begin working on the greenhouse gas emissions in 111D next year as we ramp up how the EPA is going to be regulating emissions from utility companies. That will be a big focus of ours in the next couple of years. So, um, and with that, I will just like to pause, and I'll, I'll mention to you before we get started, we're going to talk for about half an hour, 45 minutes, and I'd really love to welcome questions because we're lucky to have these folks here, and I want to make sure if you have any questions about what they're talking about or how to commercialize your own ideas, please, you know, in the last 15 minutes, I'd love to welcome questions, and they're going to be setting up a microphone in the middle of the room so that everyone uh, can hear your questions. But why don't we start um, with Jimmy Samarnes. I've known him for a number of years because we worked with United and also with Jim Rakashi uh, from Honeywell's UOP on the Midwestern Aviation Sustainable Biofuels Initiative. And I'll let Jimmy start off by telling you a little bit about himself as well as what United's doing in your innovation. Hard to hear you. Is this, 
this any better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I was saying that I'll keep it with my history so that you understand sort of my background and, and can appropriately really want questions at me versus Jim versus uh, Peter at uh, the Q&A session. So I, I started my career in the mid-90s um, in Washington, D.C. I studied here at the University of Chicago, um, undergrad in political science. I went out to Washington, D.C. and worked at the White House uh, for a few years and ended up focusing on public private partnerships. Um, ended up um, doing my graduate studies at Johns Hopkins and at Oxford, uh, international relations at Johns Hopkins, and an um, MBA at Oxford in England. Um, the relevance to that is um, it, it started paving the path of my career and where I am today with United Airlines, where I run the environmental global uh, sustainability division for the company. Um, and I am responsible for everything environmentally related, so from policy, global policy on carbon, climate change, to day-to-day -day compliance across the system uh, and to remediation efforts when things don't go as planned. Uh, we also have a significant program in sustainability and that also includes our biofuels initiative. Throughout my time in DC, I spent about 15 years in DC, I focused a lot on public private partnerships uh, on a variety of national security issues primarily related to cybersecurity and cyberterrorism. Um, and uh, transitioned eventually working for Firm called Lewis Allen Hamilton, who's got some name recognition lately, thanks to Mr. Stone, uh, who was a consultant there, uh, working with the uh, NSA. I came to United in 2007 and ended up focusing um, in corporate government affairs, so leveraged my experience in DC uh, and started building the program of sustainability at, at United. Um, you know, we've ended up spending a lot of our time focusing on alternative fuels. As you can imagine, being the world's largest airline, we end up consuming a lot of uh, liquid fuel. So we, we need about 4 billion gallons of jet fuel a year to operate on our flights. Uh, and you know, we fly 400,000 people every day. And fuel has this impact. It's 40% of our operating cost of the company, and therefore any volatility in fuel pricing has this impact on our uh, costs and uh, net profit in the day. So I think the the statistic that we use is a dollar increase in crude oil ends up having a $100 million cost in United. We're a very small margin business. We were bankruptcy. We've ended up in, um, in the past handful of years not making a ton of money. Uh, so every little bit uh, has a significant impact uh, in terms of what we can help save. So when you think of fuel as being a significant cost driver for the company, it's also a significant risk for the company, both from a you know, fuel perspective in terms of supply and volatility of prices, but also from a carbon perspective. You know, we've seen increasingly regional um, emissions uh, schemes pop up around the world. Uh, we're, we operate a global business. We've been very firmly advocating for a single approach to regulating aviation emissions. We made some very good progress uh, just a few months ago, actually, at ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, the UN body that regulates aviation globally. We have achieved consensus across the international community on a single approach for regulating aviation emissions, uh, working towards a goal of carbon neutral growth in 2020. So when you take a combination of you know, fuel being some cost and sort of risk driver of the company, we've ended up focusing on alternatives to fuel. If you think of our business, um, the safety is, is first and foremost the top concern. Um, so looking at alternatives to fuel um, early in the early days was a was a challenging um, proposition for many of us in the industry, um, considering how comfortable we've gotten with the fuel that we use every day. Um, so we've been since 2005 focusing on alternative fuels in the industry. Uh, that was the start of an initiative called CAPI, the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. We brought together airlines, manufacturers, and this government, um, and others to focus on creating uh, alternatives for aviation. Um, since then, uh, we've come a long way. The industry as a whole has operated more than 1,500 flights globally, um, and United, uh, as a company, has uh, its own share of involvement in significant milestones.